Okay, hi. Uh, I am Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Agalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Agalia. Today, uh, we have two other guests on our show, also from Agalia. I'm Samuel Iglesias. I'm manager at Agalia. And I'm Clayton Kraft, and I am a software developer at Agalia. Normally, on our show, we talk mostly about the web platform because that's so key to so many things that Agalia works on, but uh, it's not all we work on. <laughs> We're going to use this as kind of a jumping off point, but like, let's talk about games. Uh, I don't know. Do you like games? Yeah. Games are fun. Yeah. I, I play games a lot, actually, if you count by like the hours, but not a lot of games, like very few games, but just games that I really into. Um, but none of those are like particularly, they're usually like a little older. Like I have a PS4 and I, I guess a PS5 is better, but. To me, you know, my PS4 is kind of good, but apparently even your PS4 is uh, often you can't get as good games as you can for a PC. And um, until very recently, at least um, gaming on Linux, I guess, was also not super great. Um, I remember a long time ago I used Wine to play Railroad Tycoon on Linux. <laughs> <laughs> I think half the people I've heard uh, heard from who used Wine used it to play Railroad Tycoon specifically. It was a pretty good, like it worked pretty well. Um, the, and there were not a lot of games I, at the time I could think of that you could say that about. So I don't know. It um, shows your age, you know, <laughs> if you are mentioning that specific game. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So when I think about game systems, though, I also think about, you know, proprietary stuff. Like, I don't think anybody really tended to think about, like, Nintendo or Sega or PlayStation or what was, the, like, the Dreamcast? That was another one, right? Yeah. Um, yep. And uh, that's all kind of changed a little bit with the Steam Deck, right? Yeah. Actually, the, the Steam Deck is a... Portable handset console. I think it is ideal for parents, you know, <laughs> because at the end you can play around without uh, having to, to have access to the TV. <laughs> yeah, so it's like a console, but it's a handheld, sort of like the Nintendo Switch, right? Right. Um, yeah, it's very similar in size. Um, it seems really successful, and I guess you can play some pretty comparatively high-end games on it. Um, yeah, yeah, indeed. Actually... Um, the good thing about the Steam Deck is like it's very similar to a computer. I mean, we can, it's arguable if we are talking about a console or, or a computer because of the specs, you know. They are AMD, CPU, and, and GPU. We have, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very comparable to a normal computer. And actually, the, the Steam Deck has a very, very nice features. One is the, let's see, the, the console view, the launcher that they have to launch the games, right? Um, but also it has the desktop view. So it runs a normal Linux desktop. That, so at the end, you plug it into a dock station and you have a normal computer um, like, like any other computer at your home, right? And regarding this, a lot of software development, mainly target to, to add support to it, at the end is generic and, and could be beneficial to any Linux user. For, estam for example, we, we can talk about work in the kernel, Working the graphics drivers, working the system integration in Linux. So yeah, it's a, it's a amazing device, um, and we can. Uh, unfortunately for us, Igalia is is working in many of these areas. Clayton, for example, you can you uh, explain all the work that you have been doing lately? Yeah, so most of my work has been in the operating system itself, which, um, as you mentioned, is running Linux. So I, I believe a lot of other consoles that exist do use some open source components here and there. I'm not aware of any of them that are actually running like a full Linux distribution. The one that Valve is developing is based on Arch Linux. And a lot of my work has been fixing issues with like hardware initialization, um, enabling some security related stuff in the OS, uh, some pretty low level OS stuff. But the, the actual Steam Deck, the way it, it can run a lot of these PC games is, is through um, a compatibility layer. It's actually very similar to your experience, Brian, with uh, running 
Railroad Tycoon on Wine. Um, it is using Wine for a lot of these games that were designed for Windows only um, in order to run them on Linux. And so a lot of the work that I'm doing and some of my colleagues is, is basically to um, get this Linux distribution that runs on the Steam Deck in shape enough to be able to execute these games that were designed originally for an entirely different operating system, Windows, <laughs> to run on the, the console in a way that, you know, is very playable. Yeah, and not only that, I mean, for example, uh, at the end, the Steam Deck is a product that uses uh, hardware, so you need to add um, driver support for it. Um, one of the areas that we have been working uh, is about the kernel in Linux. For example, it's, it's usually a problem when you are playing a game. <laughs> I mean, I say usually because it happens to me in the past, right? you know, that you are playing a game and you are, you know, beating the boss. And once you are in the in the very last punch to it, it hangs the, the, the console, right? It happens to me in the past with, with my old Xbox. <laughs> the, the poor <laughs> console died at that moment. <laughs> you know, the red light thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, for example, one of the work there was to to recover gracefully from that, to try to gather all the logs and, and issues. Of course, push it to the Valve server so they can. I mean, they have uh, some developers or or somebody, you know, um, analyzing the error, but also putting like a screen to the user saying, "Okay, there is an error. Don't worry, don't panic. We are going to reboot the computer. I mean, the the console." Um, and that's it. So this is one of the work that we have been doing. All the tasks that we have been working on uh, was the performance, because sometimes there are applications that are slowing down the system, but you don't know which. Um, that is a, a problem, you know, because Valve always will want to, you know, to squeeze all the hardware performance. Um, and it's a problem which you don't know, which is the, the which was the culprit, right? Yeah. Um, so at the end, there is a feature in the kernel which is called uh, split lock, which is to punish these kind of applications that are not doing the right thing in the architecture, uh, as architectural wise, um, and in order to detect them. Of course, there are games that are, you know, legacy games. As they are proprietary, there is no possibility to fix the, uh, the their behavior or the source code. And that's normal. I mean, that's fine. So our work was, for example, to tell uh, the user space to tell the operating system that this is happening so the in, the application can continue punish the, punish the, the application or or can um, you know forget about it and say okay that's that's normal and come back to fully performant way another thing is about power management with a handset console I mean it's very important having as many hours of battery as, as you can um, and there is one feature that uh, powers off the part of the GPU when it's not, uh, you know, running through the applications in a, on a demand way. So again, what we are uh, working on was to offer that feature to user space, so the the scheduler or or any other application in in, in SteamOS. Um, can decide if they can switch off the GPU because it's safely to do that um, or not, right? Yeah, so as you see, we are working in, in performance, uh, in power management, recovering from errors, these kind of things that, you know, uh, they, they, they were there, but they are put in there in a usable way uh, so the, the SteamOS operating system can... Uh, use it without any problem, and at the end, you know, is, improve the experience of the users. Yeah, so, does any of you actually use the Steam Deck? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not only for my day job, but yeah, I also own one um, that I've had for a while, and and I use it a lot to play. Um, I, I've been a big PC gamer for pretty much my whole life, and have been trying to game on Linux for well over 15 years now, I think. And the situation improved dramatically when Valve released their Steam client, which is what they use for distributing games. 
when they when they released a native Steam client for Linux like around ten years ago, suddenly there were just tons of games that were no longer that were not available on Linux that you could then get and run on your system. And so the Steam Deck is kind of a continuation of that. It's it's using the same Steam client that they they release on Linux for desktops to run the same games on the same on this console. And so a lot of the work that Samuel mentioned and the work that I'm doing and, and the work that my colleagues are doing and, and pretty much everybody that's working on the Steam Deck uh, for Valve is making improvements to the Linux kernel, to Linux applications and just general stuff around distributions. And a lot of this also benefits um, Linux desktops and, and laptops and, and other devices that are running these uh, operating systems and so it's it's cool like we might make a change that improves performance when running a certain game but it also might make your desktop run faster too right because a lot of the same problems exist over there and it's targeting kind of the same hardware and stuff so it's it's not like we're just making changes for a very specific product that will never benefit anything else by helping this product and making changes to help it run better and run games and stuff. Uh, we're also, you know, our changes are contributing back to just the general experience of running Linux on, you know, totally unrelated hardware, which I think is, is really cool. Yeah. Something that amazed me is how Valve is uh, tackling this. I mean, they are very aligned with open source movement. I mean, they, a lot of our work is purely upstreamed uh, later, uh, later on. So at the end, as, as Clayton was saying, everybody benefits from it. Um, and, and it's amazing. They consider Linux as a first-class citizen with the release of the Steam client like 10 years ago, something like that. And nowadays with this uh, product, um, it's amazing. I, mean, I think this, like, this as a topic really aligns with things that we talk about a lot because we talk about the, the sort of commons that everything else is built on and like Egalia's role in trying to make that a healthier situation. So the things that you're saying are a lot of these are echoed in a talk that um, one of our colleagues gave that was just recently uh, posted to YouTube. Uh, it was called Hacking the Linux Kernel to Get More FPS. It's from FOSDEM 2023. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good talk. <laughs> yeah, it's a good talk. I, I would recommend people go give it a watch um, because a lot of it is also a, about this, right? Like it, he highlights just a ton of the things that were done in pursuit of something for gaming that, you know, are wildly applicable and helpful in other things. And this is, you know, sort of the thing that interests me a lot about any kind of invention at all is like whatever you deliver makes other things suddenly possible and there's an interplay here i think right like i you you can have things that were not developed for gaming that make it more possible to bring gaming <laughs> but then you can have things that are done in the interest of gaming that are wildly helpful for other things and finding companies like valve who are supporting things there are really really helpful i think uh, also, in the graphics world, we recently did the Mesa driver, Vulcan drivers. That was the Raspberry Pi Foundation, I believe, that funded that work. But a similar, I, the similar thing there, right? Like, it's yeah. Just... For for example, in in the case of the graphics, we have been working in the uh, kernel drivers for AMD GPU. Some examples of, of this work, like, is is improving the color adjustments and how the do the. Um, color correction or calibration of the displays. Uh, so it is automatically done, uh, for example, taking into account the, the lightning, uh, the shading in real time, or adaptive color management, yeah, th things like that. You know? So at the end is make it, again, uh, making usable something that is supported by, by the hardware. And, and we have been working on, on other areas that are somehow related to graphics as well. This is... I mean, coming back to, to the previous topic, which was Valve investing a lot of on, on open source and, and actually improving the overall experience in, in Linux desktop, a lot of, of the work that, for example, Igalia was doing, it also involves very different areas. And at the end, everything is influenced by, by the Steam Deck. 
For example, uh, Clayton were comment was commenting before about the uh, translation layers to be able to run Windows games on Linux. So they are using a fork of Wine. Um, and to do this, this translation from Direct3D to Vulkan, or to OpenGL, or to whatsoever, they are using a set of libraries. And it's amazing because this work also um, drive the, um, the innovation in the Vulkan specification itself. There are many Vulkan extensions that have been developed and, and released in, in the last years that is about adding a compatibility layer with Direct3D in order to facilitate that translation, the games, right? Other thing is about the graphics. Um, of course, graphics drivers, they, they need to be very, very solid, very reliable, because any any book, any uh, visual glitch is going to be immediately noticed by, by the user, right? So we have been working in, in a CI system, a continuous integration system, in order to you know test uh, deep uh, in depth all the um, the graphics drivers that are being used by the Steam Deck, but also in Mesa. And yeah, is, is th this, uh, these are just some examples of work that goes beyond drivers, uh, hardware support via drivers or, or system integration. But this, you know, at the end, improving uh, a lot the experience in, in the Linux desktop. Okay, so um, I think this is like, uh, you know, our, our show has been traditionally about the web platform, but then more largely about the, the commons and the ecosystem around it. And I, I constantly say that, you know, Egalia work, works on that and why I think that's important, why it's important to have like a good model that supports it. And, but I think also a lot of the work that we do, you know, like the web platform commons is sort of ultimately in many ways built on this other commons, which is Linux in a lot of cases. And so, uh, for example, we have all kinds of things coming to the web that, you know, this low level work will enable for higher level browser stuff. So did, can anybody speak to that a little bit? Yeah. One good example, I think is the, it's the R thing, you know, uh, nowadays we are working on adding the support in the graphics drivers and at the end, this will benefit, um, other applications such as web browsers, right? This is a, a very interesting feature that, that could be in, improve a lot the quality of, of reproducing videos, for example, or content in the web, right? Yeah, I think like a lot of people have not really dug into or thought about this really hard, but like the web is everything about the web, um, CSS, Canvas, like everything is based on basically sRGB. And now we're, we're getting into like, you know, other color spaces and like HDR for that to work. It has to be built on things like these graphic drivers at the core, right? Yeah. Yeah, indeed. It's like another example for this is also the web GPU theme, right? Um, at the end, it's kind of um, a standard to, to run things. <laughs> the thing is they are using the web browser for, for running them. Right. I, I remember some projects about, I don't know, uh, they were, if I recall correctly, compiling Doom or one game of of, of that time mm -hmm. uh, on web GPU and then running it in the browser. So this is kind of very interesting stuff, right? Um, there have been a lot of uh, really interesting things like that. And um, especially also like WebAssembly makes that maybe even better. Uh, we have compilers folks working on the open source stuff for those for WebAssembly as well. Uh, I just think that this is really this is really great and important that sort of we like we as workers at Agalia, but also like the people who support us and the other people who work on all of these open source projects. Like we are contributing to a commons that benefits all of us. And it, like, it's amazing to me, the potential of this, um, as we begin to collectively realize how much is there. Right. I mean, I don't think that anybody would have 15 years ago said, yeah, you could, you could like make a product that was like a computer that was gaming, that was you know, geared toward just regular consumers, not really 
just extremely niche Linux aficionados, right? But like <laughs> something that like your kids would go, oh, that is cool and I want it, you know? But yeah, you see, we can do that. And when we do that, we also make all these other amazing things more possible too. That I think that's just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, actually, one thing that related to this is like, um, you see very separate uh, development works for example, things that are happening in the web browser, then things that are happening in the graphics drivers, uh, and then somehow they are <laughs> interconnected <laughs> and, and improve a lot, right? Uh, the, the whole experience and you can develop new products, you can run things that were not expected like five years, 10 years ago. Um, that's, that's amazing. And actually, if you tell me 20 years ago, for example, that the web is going to be everywhere, like you are going to run uh, user interface using web browsers, HTML5 and things like that. You are going to have a lot of products that are just running a web browser and, and a Linux kernel mostly, right? <laughs> um, you will have operating system like Chrome OS. You will have things like that. It's, it's like, wow. Um, and things that are apparently completely unrelated, then you can put stick them together and create a, a, a great product, right? And this is again a very the Steam Deck is a very good example of this, right? Like you have everything there already. You have a Linux kernel, you have the, the Linux desktop, you have uh, graphics drivers, you have everything there. But then a company like Valve just put it them together, uh, put a nice case there and, and then sell uh, millions of them, right? Because they they just found a way to to make it like flashy to to the end users, and and that's great, you know, that this is happening. Yeah, super cool. I'm gonna go order myself a Steam Deck now. <laughs> uh, you won't you regret it. Both me. <laughs> I I have actually wanted one for a while, and this has only convinced me more that I should buy one. So. <laughs> Goodbye, actually, free time. <laughs> actually, was a retired gamer, and now and now that I am. <laughs> uh, parent of, of two kids uh, I am using I am playing games again thanks to this Steam Deck actually now yeah. it's, it's just switching it on and five minutes later I'm playing a re really good game and then half an hour later I can switch it off and continue next day and, and that's great so I can't speak um, towards like other consoles and like what contributions they've made back towards web related stuff um but what I can say is uh, I have a lot of experience dealing with other embedded devices, um, specifically running Linux. And a common pattern I see in the industry is that companies will take like the Linux kernel or other components that they need for their product. They will make changes to it um, within like a private repository or something. Cause like during platform enabling and when you're building a product, you need to move fast, right? Usually faster than upstream can keep up with merging your changes. So you can't rely on 100% upstream stuff to get your product out the door in most cases, right? Cause you're fixing hardware bugs and whatever. And so they'll make these improvements in their own fork of whatever components they need. And oftentimes they will not submit those changes back upstream and they'll just kind of live like off on the side and people will forget about them or um, you know, they may not even comply with the, the license that the component was under and they may not even release the source code, right? Unless they're really hounded for it. Um, so a lot of these improvements that they might be making to make their product run faster or use less power or, you know, just be better um, may not find their way upstream. And so I don't know if that's the case with like consoles in particular, but it's a very common pattern I see with like phones and set top boxes and other embedded devices that use uh, open source components. Yeah. Finding organizations that are funding the work upstream is really, it's great and refreshing. Uh, mm. Eric, did you have something you were going to say? No, I was agreeing with what you were saying that uh, it's, it's always, I mean, it's great, but it's also sort of fortunate to find clients who are, you know, not only willing to fund work, but also <clears throat> allow what's done for them to be pushed upstream because then the entire, you know, the entire community benefits. 
who did it and why did they do it? It gets just maybe lost to the history books, but it's really, really important. Yeah, I'd be curious to know. I mean, are the, do you have some s- specific examples of things that got upstreamed that maybe, you know, that you're particularly excited about being available to the wider community? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is all of the improvements to the graphics drivers for the GPU used in the Steam Deck. Um, as Samuel mm-hmm. mentioned, it is a GPU by a company called AMD, who also makes processors. Uh, and so I own an AMD GPU on my desktop that I use for gaming, and it uses the exact same driver that uh, we're currently hacking on for the Steam Deck. So mm-hmm. any improvements that get made there um, eventually find their way to my desktop and you know help my gaming experience. So <laughs> from a... like completely selfish perspective. I'm really excited about that one because I get to benefit from it pretty much directly, um, (laughs) which is really nice. Uh, I know there's a lot of other improvements in the kernel that are a little more low level that help with like um, performance in particular. Um, I'm not sure if we want to get into that much detail here, but (laughs) because I think it's, and actually uh, some of it was mentioned in uh, Andre's talk that, um, hacking the Linux kernel for more FPS. So again, if, mm-hmm. if you're interested in, in this stuff, that talk is really great at um, showing some of the low level changes that were made to the Linux kernel for the Steam Deck specifically, but also help greatly with performance elsewhere on other systems. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that too, because um, it's all upstream, it's all in the kernel now. And if you go and get a system with a recent Linux kernel, you're more than likely going to be using some of those things that were added um, specifically for this project, but you know, you get to also benefit from it. Yeah, I, I agree with Clayton. And also it's, it's important to say that um, Valve also, they are sponsoring work to improve this Steam Deck. Um, their ultimate goal is to improve the Linux desktop uh, in order to be a reference gaming platform. And, and that's that's important, right? It's, as I said before, it's like we are working on very different areas that uh, um, at first sight is like, at first glance is like they are completely unrelated. Uh, but at the end, you look at the big picture and you see that overall they are improving the Linux desktop in, um, um, a lot, right? So, so yeah, another example that I, I, I could think about is um, um, recovering from GPU hangs. I commented before about the logging, the errors, and so on. But there is the the possibility of recovering gracefully for for a, a hang of the GPU, which is a very usually you need to reboot the machine. And the idea is um, is just to try to avoid that as much as possible, so the user or, or at the end the the gamer can continue playing their game. Uh, without any problem after some seconds of of, of delay, right? Um, so that's that's the kind of experience that at the end will be will make uh, Linux desktop as, as a really um, competitive gaming platform, right? Uh, until now, you know, Linux was gaining on um, on server side, on mobile with Android. Um, it's, it's, I mean, <laughs> the, uh, the, the market share on, of Android is huge, um, but we were lacking the Linux desktop. And, and it looks like this this effort uh, from Valve, probably not in the short-term future, but I think that in the long-term future, we'll posi- position it Linux as a very competitive gaming platform, right? I don't know if you see that as well or... <laughs> Were you asking me or who were you asking? Me? Uh, uh, all of you, come <laughs> on. <Anyone>? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, the thing here is like, I'm sometimes, because I'm working at Egalia, I think that we are living in a bubble where we are seeing uh, Linux improving a lot. But for example, this Steam Deck was the, was the first product that I have been seeing using it by my networks, right? Uh, and yeah, my, it's awesome. my relatives. So it's like, wow, you know, this is mainstream stuff, right? Um, yeah. 
I, I've been trying to get my relatives and friends to use Linux for many, many years. And this is the first thing that I can throw in front of them. Then most of them are like, yeah, I can use this. It's, you know, usable and, and it's intuitive. And um, so, yeah, I think it, uh, from like, again, a totally selfish perspective, I think it's great because I can I can finally start converting some of these folks to, to using Linux in some capacity. <laughs> I think one of the things that is great about like the Steam Deck thing is that, you know, all the people, all the organizations that we work with, um, like obviously they make money, right? Like they, they have to make money from something to provide money to sponsor this work. And I think that one of the really cool, exciting things about Valve is that like they're making a product which like itself is tied to Linux. And, and so they're both very invested in the success of that, but also like they have a monetary model to support it, sort of core to your product. Do you know what I mean? So I, I think that is a, a really hard to measure positive thing that will ultimately be really a really big deal. Yeah, I can only hope that it encourages more companies to um, follow the same path. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, I hope more Steam Deck like consoles or or devices will appear in the future because at the end that's that's going to show that Linux is ready for for managing uh, this kind of products, right? Yeah, also if it could kind of, uh, yeah, there's the whole console part, but also like if this could serve as an example for other devices, because I mean, humans are making, we're putting chips in everything, right? <laughs> um, huh. Like I think you could buy clothing now that, you know, that's quote unquote smart or whatever. So I hope it encourages more companies looking to productize things to choose this sort of model that's like use Linux or a similar open source based distribution and and most importantly, any changes you make to support your product, you contribute those back to uh, the upstream. So that way, when you go to make version two of your product or, um, you know, someone else wants to build upon your work, uh, it's available and they can do that. And, you know, who knows, maybe your original product benefits from changes that people in the community or other companies have made to, you know, your original code. So, you know, everyone wins. <laughs> yeah. And I don't. You know, I'm. I have to admit, I'm speculating here a little bit, but I would, I would presume that this is why Valve picked Linux in the first place. Is that it's, you know, it's open source, and so there's a lot of flexibility there. They don't, you don't have the same kind of vendor lock-in, as it were, <laughs> if you know, using a proprietary operating system like Windows or, or something like that. Um, and it's, it's interesting to me that there are so many consoles that are you know like you said Samuel going the windows route and that you part of me thinks that Valve would have done that right because they were like made video games and they made a lot of windows video games and so you would think uh that they that they might say well we know windows let's make our console based on windows but instead they they sort of had the foresight to say hey we should we should do this in a more open way, you know, using more open technologies um, because that's more robust over time. Yeah, and actually, I think the point here is not only about the games. It's, it's about the store. And they have the Steam mm. store. Um, and imagine a future like, I don't know, let's say Microsoft say, okay, I forbid any, any store uh, from my operating system and only mm. it's accessible mine, right? I right. mean, we have seen that in with, with Apple iOS, and we have been seen that in, in in other operating systems as well. So, it's not yeah. like crazy <laughs> hypothesis, right? Um, and I, I think Valve is protecting themselves by investing on Linux in that sense, right? Uh, yeah. So yeah, I think it makes sense uh, from their point of view. They have a product. I mean, they don't. They are. They don't pay any kind of license to anybody. They don't rely on third parties to release a new version. They don't. They don't depend on others. And I think this is a, a very good uh, advice for other companies, right? They're like relying on open source 
um, you you make yourself more robust uh, for the future. Uh, you you don't depend on others. You don't have a vendor locking. And from the user point of view, also imagine a future where this this version of this team deck um, is um, is not supported anymore. At the end, you can you can flash another Linux distribution and and still using it as a normal mm. computer, like like all the laptops that we have at home, right? Yeah, yeah. So so is this Steam Deck sort of customizable or hackable in that way, like easily or? Oh yeah, I mean <laughs> the hardware is kind of not so much. I mean you can replace some components, I believe, like mainly you can repair it to some degree like um replace the fan i think and the uh local storage device can be replaced or upgraded too oh, okay. um which is nice cuz you know hardware components do die so being able to repair it i think is important but from a software perspective and speaking specifically to your question about like how much can you hack around on this um it is incredibly hackable from as, for being a console um, and kind of more like what you would expect for a laptop or a, a desktop or something. Um, you can install, you can install windows on it. Like I've seen people do that. I <laughs> personally would never do that, but it is an option. Yeah. Um, you can install other Linux distributions. Um, like there's one that I, that I currently maintain and I was able to install it in an afternoon on the steam deck. And that's basically unheard of with other console things. Um, in pretty much every case that I know of, it's the manufacturer doing everything they can to prevent you from running any software on there that they don't want you to run, including the operating system. And so it's like, a, like I, I had a PlayStation 3 specifically so I could run Linux on it. And, and then one day Sony was like, nope, you can't do that anymore. And they killed it with an update, the ability to boot a Linux distribution on it. And I immediately like put mine on craigslist to sell it because i was like this thing is you know a useless thing to me now um mm. so it's yeah like most manufacturers don't want you to modify it or do anything and in in the case of the steam deck it's like it's like another computer that just happens to have controls on it that make it really useful for um handheld gaming <laughs> yeah that's cool um it's really interesting to me that we can we could collectively choose to make linux really really great and it's very much within our power to like outdo everything really like we just have to get people to decide to do it and when they do great things happen right like that's that that's part of my takeaway from this is that like we're talking a whole lot about the great things that we, just some of the companies that we work with but you know the more we do of this the the greater everything gets for everyone and that that's really positive because it's not really beholden to any one company or anything yeah definitely maybe i'm you know a bit biased because i pretty much only work on open source projects and have been for years but um yeah i very strongly believe this is the right model for software development and you know not only are you able to hack on stuff that, you know, like, like I said before, during product development, things move fast. You need to fix problems as they come up very quickly. And, you know, in order to have a product that you can sell when you need to, and by using components that are open source, you have the ability to hack on those things as much as you need, um, which is great. You don't get that with like proprietary components, right? Like you might submit a bug to the, the, company that provided the component and they may or may not get to it depending on you know how much revenue they think that you're going to bring them as a customer and like what your agreements are with them and and whatever right so you're kind of as someone was saying you're kind of uh at their at their discretion or, or whatever and so um maybe they can't help you fast enough but if you're choosing components that are open source that you can go and modify as you need um you know it's great and you know, if you submit those changes back to the upstream projects, then those changes will always be there. And if you need to build upon it in the future, it's there and you can do it and you can find it. And in the meantime, everybody else is able to improve upon it, like even your customers. I mean, there's there's 
patches and, and changes that I've come across in the wild for the Steam Deck that were created by gamers and people in the community, not by Valve and not by Egalia, not by other contractors that they're paying for this, but just people who like, you know, ran into a problem or something and they found a workaround. They were able to do that because all the stuff is open source. They can go and poke around the code and write patches for it. And to me, that's that's very powerful. <laughs> um, and I, I think the Steam Deck and products that follow a model like this will likely live well beyond their design lifetimes because, because you can take the hardware and run whatever you want on it. You actually truly own the thing as opposed to like owning it for as long as the manufacturer decides to release software updates for it. Right. Um, yeah. There's a lot of products that, that ship with an oh, operating yeah. system that, you know, don't get updates after two years and that's that, right. <laughs> you throw it away and get another one and that's yeah. A mess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Hey, I'm really, really glad that we got a chance to do this episode. Um, I hope that we do some more like this um, that are not entirely about just uh, the web platform, but do manage to, you know, show the connections and how, how they're related. So I just want to say thanks for um, coming on and talking about uh, steam powered open source uh, with us and uh, graphics and, and games and game systems and open source and yeah, just thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us.